Good morning, welcome to CSIS. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to see uh, such a nice crowd uh, here on an early morning. Um, although I do see that some of you look a little bleary-eyed, which I assume either means that uh, you got up early to watch the lunar eclipse, um, or that like me, you're a disappointed Nationals fan. Uh, so um, condol condolences uh, to, to the Nationals fans. Uh, let me also welcome our many online viewers uh, and remind you that you can follow us on Twitter at CSIS, hashtag CSIS live. Uh, those of you in the room can also do that if you must, but please do it silently. Uh, set your devices on stun uh, so it doesn't disturb our speakers. So six years ago, uh, next month, then-President George W. Bush uh, invited a group of fellow leaders to Washington for an urgent conference on the unfolding global financial crisis to elicit international cooperation among a group of countries representing about 85 percent of stemming the economic bleeding and stabilizing financial markets. Thus was born the Group of 20, or G20, Leaders Forum. Less than a year later, at, their, at the end of their third summit in Pittsburgh, G20 leaders looked back on the unprecedented, unprecedented joint efforts they had made to revive the global economy after its near-death experience and issued this verdict, which surely must be the shortest sentence ever written in a summit communique. It worked. As Australia prepares to host the ninth G20 summit in Brisbane on November 15th, 16th, most people interested in these issues in global economic governance would still look back on those early summits and say without hesitation, it worked. But with the global economy still underperforming today, with the sense of common purpose that brought the G20 countries together uh, having dissipated, uh, and with the G20 having a more difficult time demonstrating visible results, a lot of people are asking, yes, but is it working? Well, my answer to that is broadly yes. Uh, as I see it, the G20 continues to serve three important, if not indispensable, functions in global economic governance. First, uh, preparing for the next crisis, which surely will come sooner or later. Uh, let's call this the fire engine function. Every town needs a fire engine, polished and ready to go. Second, setting a global policy agenda designed to enhance global growth and strengthen the international financial system. And third, building habits of cooperation among countries that have not had much experience cooperating on much of anything, uh, yet have a vital shared stake in the health of the global economy. In addition to these three higher level functions, I think the G20 still has the ability to make concrete, if incremental, progress in addressing some of the world's most difficult economic problems. So I do believe the world is better off with a G20 than without one. Indeed, I'd say that if we didn't have a G20, we'd need to invent it. Uh, but clearly, the G20 has work to do in justifying its role and relevance today. And that's the tall order facing this year's host, uh, Australia. As one would expect, Australia has stepped up to this task with enthusiasm. Um, as we're going to hear later, uh, Australia has sensibly set out a few broad themes. Uh, for its host year and uh, has been working hard to get agreement among the, G the G20 countries on a number of concrete actions uh, to promote those objectives. And, and this is the key to perceptions of the G20's relevance, I think. If people see it working towards goals that they broadly accept as worthwhile and, and important, and they see what I would call bricks in the road being laid down towards those goals, then uh, they will accept that all these meetings and working groups and summits is a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, but we've organized this conference to let you draw your own conclusions about the G20. We've pulled together a real A list of uh, senior officials and scholars uh, and uh, business people from Australia, from the United States, from other G20 members to explore these questions, to look ahead at what to expect from the G20 summit in Brisbane and to consider ways the G20 can demonstrate its continued relevance as the premier forum for international economic cooperation. <laughs> 
So we have a rich program today, as, you, as you've seen. I'm excited to get started. So with no further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, my, or invite my colleague, Ernie Bauer, to come up to the podium and introduce our first speaker. Uh, among other things, Ernie, you can come up. Uh, Ernie uh, is um, in charge of our Pacific Partners Initiative, which uh, is the sort of center of excellence we have here uh, for, among other things, all things Australian. So Ernie, please. Thank you, Matt. Um, and congratulations on, the, on gathering this incredible group of uh, speakers, uh, experienced experts, and, and a great audience. Uh, the morning after a, a, a Nats loss, which is a, a real stinger for Washington. But uh, I'm about to introduce a guy who may, I, I'm not sure where his alliances lie in, in Australian sports. I guess he would be a, a Perth, uh, West Australia fan but I know the Rabbitohs have just won uh, down under, and uh, I don't know how he feels about that. So anyway, either, either he's commiserating with us or he's... Oh, okay. <laughs> is he? Okay. Um, okay. He is a Dockers fan, for those of you in Australia watching, and if he can disclaim this. But when Matt... Um, Matt, of course, ably handles uh, uh, the G20 um, uh, portfolio here, but when it comes to Australia hosting, I lobbied hard to, uh, for a chance to get on the, on the docket today and introduce uh, a good friend and a real, um, a real institution, I think, in Washington, someone who's raised the alliance uh, between the United States and Australia up to levels that we haven't seen before. And he's been a champion of this relationship far longer than his time, his five years here in Washington as ambassador. Ambassador Kim Beasley is, um, is a real uh, man of Australia. Uh, he's run uh, all parts of Australian, um, or many parts of Australia's uh, governance uh, structure, from finance, uh, finances to uh, defense and security relationships, and, and, and now uh, diplomacy and, and foreign policy. Uh, there's no better person to talk to us uh, today, I think, to set the, set the context anyway for Australia's hosting the G20 in Brisbane. So, Kim, uh, please come up and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much, Ernie. Uh, firstly, just to set the record straight, because I understand uh, we're being broadcast. I'm a Dockers fan. <laughs> I want that to be noted. But that's a different code, of course. The Rabbitohs won the Rugby League Premiership, and it's one of those wonderful rag-to-riches uh, exercises. All Australians will be happy about the Rabbitohs win, except for their miserable opponents. But that's a, uh, that, 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 is a, that, that is a good way to start a... Well, to start a G20 season, though, I don't think there'd be a single person at the ground who connected the Rabbitohs and the G20. Look, uh, I used to be in politics, and there was... An, for, I should thank the CSIS for organising this. This is a terrific forum. It's, it's great for us. It'll be great for the Treasurer, who'll appear later on, so I don't dare say terribly much, lest I steal his thunder. And, uh, and he is definitely a man whose thunder you do not steal. Uh, Matt, terrific that uh, the, the role you've played in getting all this together. When I was in politics, there was an expression, running scared. And all my political life, because I had a marginal seat, I ran scared. That is, you operate on the permanent assumption that you can be defeated, and indeed defeat is likely. I would say that our stewardship, which we've adopted towards this year, of the G20 uh, with enthusiasm, I think with a degree of success in the preliminary meetings, with, a, uh, with an intense scrutiny as to what we ought to be doing to keep the G20 relevant, is all represented by that expression, running scared. We are scared this might not succeed. We are scared for the consequences of ourselves and the globe if it does not. We are scared because there are so few points now globally of stability and direction. We have a diffuse global political system where, by and large, problems do not get resolved. Uh, and who would have thought, when you think about it, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, 
that we could sit in a situation where the three main oil producers of the Middle East, two are basically taken out. Uh, one, uh, one continues to operate and think that in those circumstances you could run a prosperous and stable global economy. Uh, these are, we are living in extraordinary times in the worst way. So for uh, all the institutions that seek to promote growth and stability globally, uh, there is a premium on their success. And uh, we in Australia uh, look at this uh, very much uh, in that light. The G20 has got to succeed. It represents 85% of global production. Uh, it, is, it represents countries which by and large uh, have a noteworthy international outlook. They're sophisticated and they ought to almost by definition uh, be responsible. Or to be clear, and is clear, that global health matters to all of them and to the others who produce, of course, the other 15%. But the current rates of global economic growth, trade and employment, as reported by the IMF, WTO and ILO, are really way below where they could be, and certainly way below where they were prior to the global financial crisis. For example, the IMF this year predicts 3.4% growth. The average uh, before uh, the crisis was about four. The ILO has identified us as having 62 million fewer jobs globally uh, than would have been the case if the pre-global uh, financial crisis uh, growth rates had been sustained. Uh, when it comes to global trade, WTO is predict predicting a 4.7% growth this year, but that compares with a 6% average in the period of time before the global financial crisis. So whatever it is that the international institutions have been doing, and we're now quite a long time from the peak of that global financial crisis, what is not happening is us being back at, uh, at where we were at that point of time. I actually think that this is a, a moment when the G20 actually needed Australia uh, to be in the position where it is. And you know, one doesn't particularly want to get up, and Australians, it's not the Australian form to, to boast national attitudes. But I would say that uh, there'd be no member of the G20 more devoted to its success than Australia, more single-mindedly uncritical of the view that this is the, and must be the premier conversation that takes place on the global economy followed by the premier locus of global action. We really believe that. And uh, so at this point of time, when for a whole variety of reasons, we're looking at, um, uh, sources in the global economy, economy of ho uh, the global management, not just the economy, of hope and direction. This is, uh, from the Australian point of view, uh, very much a key moment. We put down a, an agenda focusing on three areas. The first is promoting strong economic growth and employment outcomes by empowering the private sector. The second is making the global economy more resilient to future shocks. And thirdly, strengthening global institutions and ensuring their ongoing re relevance to the global economy of the 21st century. Now, there's a stack of pieces uh, to the puzzle in all of these, and I've got no doubt the Treasurer is going to tell you exactly how that's going to be achieved uh, when he appears here later on during the course of the day. Uh, but uh, I just want to mention one proposition that the Australians are focused on as the sort of way in which you achieve uh, those, or contribute seriously to achieving those three goals. In February, at the February G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, the G20 members committed to increasing their collective GDP by 2% over five years, 2% uh, over what was their prediction as to what they would be capable of achieving in that period of time. Achieving this commitment 
would be a boost of over $2 trillion and millions of new jobs in the global economy. The ambition has to be delivered through a combination of trade, investment and employment measures captured in growth strategies which each country is preparing to collectively work towards achieving that goal. This is a first for the G20 and is helping to drive our ambitions. Importantly, and this is critical, I mean, one thinks, what a good idea, 2% over and above what we predict in global growth. If the G20 fails to achieve that, it will simply lend massive weight to the view that the G20 is not the appropriate forum for a global economic discussion. The, G, the G20 ministers have laid down one of those litmus tests in politics, the political equivalent of a red line. And the, the G20 simply has to walk across that red line, or well, the countries in the G20 have to walk across that red line over the five years to sustain credibility in the publics, which basically, by and large, determine the characters of the governments who are, are members of the G20. So we've got a month to go to the Brisbane summit now, and we're at the sharp end of trying to reach that ambition or credible policies to achieve that ambition, and we've still got a lot of work to do, but we're determined to get there. Uh, we're going to continue to work closely and productively with the G20 membership, and that, of course, for us is, uh, is massively the United States. Now, for the event today, CSIS has put together a high-calibre lineup of speakers from across the government and the private sector. To mention a couple, of course, Australia's Treasurer Joe Hockey and the US G20 Sherpa Carolyn Atkinson will be here. And I, for one, am looking forward to hearing from them. But I'm also going to be unpardonably rude, having introduced the topic today, because uh, my Treasurer turns up at Union Station at about 10 o'clock. So I'm out that door and running scared. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much, Ambassador Beasley. Those were terrific uh, uh, opening uh, comments to get us started and warmed up and, and running scared. Um, I'm only afraid of the, the, um, the, the clock, so I want to keep moving here as quickly as we can. Um, one thing I should have done at the very beginning, but I will do now, is to uh, thank our partners in this, uh, in this endeavor today, uh, the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have uh, worked closely with them on G20 and B20 matters um, for uh, several years. Uh, they have been, um, the International Chamber, uh, from the beginning, one of the key uh, uh, stakeholders providing uh, substantive input into the G20 pro process, going back to the Korea summit uh, in 2010, and they've now become some, one of the, the leading forces in helping to shape uh, a, not only a B20, Business 20 agenda, but a G20 agenda as well. So we're delighted to be partnering with them in this endeavor. And that's a good segue into our next speaker, uh, Marcus Wallenberg, who is uh, chairman of SEB, one of uh, Sweden's premier uh, financial institutions, but also uh, chairman of the ICC's G20 CEO advisory group, which uh, has been doing a lot of the, uh, the work, or most of the work, on the uh, ICC's G20, uh, B20 efforts. Uh, he also previously had served as the chairman of the uh, International Chamber of Commerce itself, and uh, he has been an active, engaged uh, participant in global policy discussions for many years. Uh, he uh, made a tragic mistake early in his uh, career when he decided to go to Georgetown University instead of Johns Hopkins SAIS uh, to do a, a degree in foreign service, but we'll forgive him for that uh, uh, on this occasion, and I'm delighted to invite uh, Marcus Wallenberg up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I don't know very much about U.S. baseball, so I have to keep my mouth shut. Um, anyway, the, uh, let me just first say thank you, CSIS and Matt and uh, everybody for arranging this. This is uh, always interesting to be uh, here because of the uh, 
where you handle all these policy issues are always in the front line and always participating in a very important debate. So uh, I've had the pleasure to, to work with CSS for a long time and my family as well. So this is great. And the G20 agenda is very important. And I can't comment, of course, on any G20 matters. But what I can do is that from a business point of view, and, and uh, Robert Milner, who sits here, and Richard Goider, uh, put together a terrific program this summer uh, in Sydney to really actively uh, introduce and, and uh, get participation from business around the world in the work towards what G20 leaders are trying to, um, to, are trying to achieve. Um, sometimes it's uh, important to remind ourselves that uh, with the background of what ICC is all about. You know, I, I'm a Swede. I'm not even supposed to be in the G20 arena. Uh, but um, I, I am there because my family has been engaged in International Chamber of Commerce since it was started. And it was started in 1919. I'll give you one minute on ICC because I, I think very few people know what it's all about. Uh, 1919, immediately after the First World War, business people were absolutely convinced that the only way to stop war and hostile actions was through more trade and more investments, nothing else. So a bunch of business people got together, formed ICC, and it's known, I think, today for some policy work, but primarily for regulating without government interference the terms of trades between companies all over the world. So ICC is a conglomeration of tens of thousands of companies around the world who agrees on how to trade with each other. And on top of that, having, and how to finance that trade, and on top of that, also settling disputes through an arbitration court system all over the world. That's what ICC is for you. But I'm here tonight, or today, to, uh, on two hats. Uh, the first one being chairman of SEB, uh, which is uh, a Northern European uh, bank primarily involved with uh, businesses. And also then, as previously was mentioned, as a group of chairman CEOs who have actively decided to want to participate in preparing on the business side for the G20 uh, agenda. And why are businesses getting involved in this? I would say primarily because we've come to the conclusion that we have to influence politicians to tell the business side of story to get this common goal of achieving more growth going forward. The business has to be part of that process, we believe. And that's why people do put a lot of effort behind it. So I'll give you a little bit of background from a European point of view. So just a few words on Europe. And that's where our business is primarily uh, based. And f of course, you can be quite concerned about the stagnation signals that we see right now. And also, the burdens that are being carried because of all the excess public and private debt burden. There's still significant adjustments that several countries need to make to regain competitiveness in our area. The fiscal restraints make the room to maneuver very limited. In most of Europe, the recapitalization of banks is still ongoing in a slow moving way, and the European Central Bank is still fighting to restore confidence. We are truly experiencing a monetary policy experiment where the patient, the global economy, is trying to get its way out of sick bay. But we shall salute all our policymakers for keeping the patient alive for the past six years. The central banks has not completely gotten its patient back on its feet, but it is there and it's getting into better shape. What we need now is structural reform. Last week, I spent a few days in Spain and Portugal. Um, the financial crisis clearly hit that part of Europe very, very hard. But hopefully, the reforms, and there have been some substantial reforms taken there, the wheels will slowly start moving again. So don't get me wrong. I salute the EU institutions and many of the things that they've done 
in the, uh, done to reform and regulate. But as always, the pace of action is of the essence, and we need more. If we don't, we might enter into a long period of stagnation. One important step that should be taken is to make EU single market more complete. For example, I believe that the energy sector, the digital economy, and the services sector should urgently be included in the quest to form one single market. This is one key to unlock greater potential for the European Union going forward. And EU must continue to advocate for a global free trade agenda, and short of that, diligently work on regional free trade agreements, notably what we're going through together with this country, with the United States, to try to conclude the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP. As mentioned earlier today, the recent evaluations by the IMF and OECD and the World Bank highlighted the significance of lower than expected growth rates in the global economy. This will have a severe impact on job creation and unemployment. We all, of course, know that already. But I believe it has to be underlined time and time again. We just cannot lose track on how important the task of the structural reforms are for the development and social stability of our societies on a long-term basis. The B20 believes that to meet the additional, the 2% additional growth target, G20 countries must commit collectively to implement unilateral structural reforms that create open and competitive environments to boost employment and prospects for diversified and sustained growth. It is difficult not to start off by stating the importance of a stable political, judicial, and security environment for any invest investment. You have to remember that business people try to avoid risk the whole time. That's why this is a very important point. Not the least for long-term investment and for the visibility and stability in terms of rules and regulations as are, are very, very vital. So through my involvement on a day-to-day -day basis with SEB, I see the need for new regulations that we've seen on the banks. But on the other hand, I think it's crucial that we all understand that the combination of all regulations imposed on banks the last few years has and probably will dampen economic activity. This in turn will hurt the recovery. It will also increase the risk for deflationary tendencies. We need investment, and we need banks to be open for that type of business going forward. So when you look at the tension and the turbulence that we see in Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Hong Kong, it is surely affecting the business climate in those days. The spillover effects are, of course, global. With political tension, protectionist thinking is regrettably on the rise. It takes political leadership and determined actions to safeguard our achievements in the global free trade arena. Whether it's the single market in the EU or the WTO, uh, which is a very important institution for us who deal with free trade. So the question is, how do we remain vigilant, cautious, and responsive to all these protectionist tendencies going forward? So I would argue that we risk getting stuck in a long-term low-growth scenario in which job creation is so slow that economic and social tension will spill over into further political instability. In some ways, you could say we are in a catch-22 situation where the investors, the money is there, but they are not really engaging at this time to the fullest extent. So the good news is, is that we actually put behind us a period of historical deleveraging throughout businesses and financial institutions. They are now, the banks are now, most cases well capitalized with solid liquidity and thus well positioned to invest if and when the right circumstances would arise. But the not so good news is that due to the global downturn, there is a clear industrial overcapacity in many sectors. So even if the economy would pick up at this time, it is doubtful 
that companies would build out capacity in any significant way to cope with that increased demand. So how do we break out of this catch-22 of lower prospects for investments, unpredictable situation, and actually do create a new wave of investments? I'll go into the B20 and the G20 now. So the, the G20, as I said earlier, is a very natural focal point for the ICC. Over the past six years, ICC has been very much engaged in this B20 work for preparation of the G20. And we formed as I, the, the, the advisory group to get about 40 CEOs to be involved in this. So now, when we have discussed all the issues in Sydney, in Sydney, which was very, very well organized uh, in preparation for the G20, I think that we have now focused on four major issues that should be important, or we think are important for the global economy. The first one is to get the effective operation of financial markets, as I said earlier. The secondly, to development of the global human capital. Thirdly, the investment environment, particularly on the development of infrastructure investments. And lastly, greater opportunities for trade in goods and services. The result of this work is about 20 proposals reinforcing themselves for actions by the G20 governments. On a positive note, I'd like to say that the commitments made by all the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in Cairns last month are signs of real progress on financial regulation and infrastructure in particular. But we should be under no illusion what the challenge we're standing ahead of when it comes to structural reform. We must continue to strongly encourage governments to make real commitments and really make them, and hopefully they will do so, implemented in a coordinated way going forward. I will not stay more on the, B20, uh, the G20 business agenda because you will discuss that later on today. But um, since I worked as a co-chair on the infrastructure group uh, at the B20, I'd like to spend a few minutes on that uh, at this uh, point in time. So we start with the premise that high quality infrastructure will underpin and do underpin economic activity within and across national borders. It promotes development in emerging economies, growth and employment in developed economies and trade between us all. On this note, I think it's important to underline the potential for the investment in green and sustainable technology as a particularly promising avenue. I think sometimes we forget in our debate the importance of green infrastructure because um, we know that there is an investment need, but we rarely combine that discussion with the environmental challenges that we actually face. And the infrastructure discussion is equally important for those of us living in the developed world, which, in my view, would risk us to become the old world unless we start getting in more into the infrastructure game and support that. It is estimated by 2030 that there will be a gap of 15 to 20 trillion US dollars in infrastructure investments. 15 to 20 trillion. That's a huge gap. And one potential capital pool to tap is actually the liquidity held by the global banking system to satisfy the new regulation. Just imagine if we could get a portion of that to fund infrastructure projects. This is one key challenge we all have for the future. And there is an estimate that over the long run, to close this gap would create more than 100 million jobs and generate 6 trillion in economic activity every year. That is a price 
that we would like to achieve. And a big part of this solution is greater private sector investment in productive infrastructure, partnering with governments to build and manage public investments much more effectively and communicating infrastructure benefits to the public. We made six recommendations to the G20 on this, in this specific uh, task group. The first one, to set a specific five-year target on investment in infrastructure. The second one was to credibly establish a national infrastructure pipeline of projects that need to be done in each uh, country. Thirdly, to establish an infrastructure hub, namely to help businesses, governments, to facilitate the development and the delivery of a pipeline of bankable, investment-ready infrastructure projects. It turns out that there are so many different regulatory hinders to infrastructure investments that you actually need a group just working with that, and that's why we call it the infrastructure hub. For, third, fourthly, work towards a greater promotion and protection of cross-border capital flows in an FDI investment model. Fifth, promote longer-term investments, not least in the sustainable technologies by re removing unnecessary regulatory dis disincentives. And lastly, implement a transparent infrastructure procurement and approval process. Because when we talk to the members, of the different G20 countries. This is one of their major obstacles that they face. <laughs> all of this, what is this all about? This is about to make more investments. This is about a way to get forward to make infrastructure a more attractive investment group as part of the private investment funds that do exist around the world. One more thing, I'd like to talk about a very crucial part for business going forward. That is that we need further investments into innovative technologies. For example, I can look at my own family. We've, we've been working with this industri industrial sense for many, many years back. And it always comes down to how do you continue to develop more innovation going forward. And um, we need to move forward, and we need to cross new frontiers. In that endeavor, we need to take risk, and with that, progress will not happen. One example we have witnessed is the beginning of the IT revolution when it comes to use in industrial manufacturing and services sector. The areas of automation, software, and big data, we are on the verge of a major breakthrough as it how to shape and better serve our societies. And finally, we need a much more genuine approach to the trade and investment agreement. We must be sure to avoid the protective period that we went through in the early 1900s and that ended up, up, actually, in a very bad situation in the 1930s. Protectionism was a big part of that. In today's integrated world, trade is global and should be regulated with a global mindset. Anybody studying businesses around the world and look at their global value chains of modern industry can testify to that. And we should actually call all of us on politicians to consider how much would be gained if such agreements came about and how much more business confidence, because this is very much about business confidence, would be created for investments. Of course, there would be hiccups and issues need to be solved, but these challenges must continuously be compared to the huge gains that we all see can come out of it. In the case of the EU and US free trade agreement, there's an estimate that we will actually add more than 1% of GDP on both sides of the Atlantic if we can get that done. Similarly, I think we can get such benefits in other parts of the world. 
This is why it's so important that the G20 moves forward on their issues. So really, of course, there are many challenges going forward. Um, but to me, basically, there are so many positive things, um, so many positive forces that we should spend all our energy to push these issues of investment and trade going forward. The fight is about getting more investments and more jobs and more growth. And uh, I'm absolutely convinced that we have a chance to do that, hopefully, in Australia. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. That was really um, tremendous on a lot of levels, uh, e explaining uh, very helpfully and clearly explained uh, the stake that business has in a strong global economy and in the G20's work to that end, uh, and the contribution that business makes to that. And in particular, I like the fact that you highlighted some of the key themes that we're going to be um, focusing on later, in particular trade and uh, infrastructure investment, which you're going to hear a lot about. Uh, today, so I really appreciate that. Thank you so much um, for those those remarks. Um, we will now uh, move straight on to our first panel. So, if I can invite the three panelists for panel one to come up and join me, um, we're going to take a break after this panel. But if you need to get up, and there is coffee uh, and there are restrooms and things uh, outside, but we uh, we will have a short break after this panel. So, uh, please come on up, uh, panel one. Everyone's here, right? Good. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, well, um, hi Mark. Um, I've said before that there are tough jobs and there are easy jobs at a think tank, and um, actually there are tough panels and there are easy panels to run. Uh, this is an easy panel. I really don't have to do anything. I'm just gonna just sort of start the clock and then let these uh, gentlemen uh, take over because you have here really, uh, no kidding, an A list of people who uh, have been working on G20 issues uh, really from day one or even before day one uh, and uh, can give you, I think, a very rich sense of what the uh, what this forum is, is really about and about the, the substantive agenda that it's pursuing and, and why that's so important. So um, I'm going to just quickly uh, say their names and positions because uh, you have bio information in, in your packets and I won't, I don't want to hold up uh, their presentations. Uh, at the far end uh, for me, your uh, left, is Mike Callahan, um, who is uh, program director at the G20 Study Center at the Lowy Institute in Sydney. Uh, Mike, as many people know, was previously the G20 finance deputy for uh, the government of Australia and involved in the G20 from, as I say, before day one. Um, and so he brings a huge, rich, hugely rich experience to this uh, conversation. Uh, he'll go first. Then uh, Mark Sobel, next to uh, Mike, is uh, my former colleague at the Treasury Department. He's Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Monetary and Financial Policy at Treasury. Uh, there are very few people who can remember a U.S. Treasury Department without a Mark Sobel uh, in it. I certainly cannot. Um, and um, and um, sadly, we are going to lose him if the, if the Senate, uh, in its wisdom, uh, does what the president uh, has asked it to do, which is to confirm uh, Mark, this is not a public announcement, right? This is already in the public domain, I think, that Mark has been nominated to be the executive director for the United States at the International Monetary Fund. Um, I think that your confirmation will come just as soon as the IMF quota reform uh, has been approved. <laughs> so, um, uh, and then uh, right next to me is Domenico Lombardi, uh, who is director for the Global Economy Program at the Center for International Governance Innovation, um, and uh, another uh, real expert who has been 
deeply involved in global economic governance, not just in his current job, but in previous uh, senior positions at the World Bank, IMF, and other uh, international financial institutions. So it's a really terrific group, and I'm going to uh, stop talking and let Mike uh, kick us off. Well, thanks very much indeed, Matt. It's, uh, thank, thank you very much to CSIS for hosting this. I'll start off uh, in the theme of this as the outlook for the G20 Brisbane Summit, and I'll give uh, an overview from someone outside of the Australian government now who has been watching what's been going on, the development, a commentator on events leading up to the Brisbane Summit, which is not far off. And basically, the point I'd make is that what we've seen over the course of 2014, I think, we've seen under the Australian presidency, we've seen some of the strengths of the G20, the strengths in the, that it can provide a political focus on issues, but we've also seen the challenges, and the challenges is implementation, being able to keep that political focus through to the momentum to be able to implement. Now, one of the, if I look at, uh, again, an overview of what's happened this year, I think one good thing we've seen is that, and Ambassador Beasley referred to this this morning, there has been a focus uh, in terms of the way Australia has been organising the agenda. It has given it a focus around these themes of growth and resilience. And I think that's very important. Uh, and all the activities have been linked to this question of growth. It's been the prism that all the various work streams have been looked at. Now, that's very important because I keep saying the G20, it's a political forum. It really isn't an economic forum as such. It's a grouping of political leaders come together, and every political leader, like a political party, has to have a clear narrative, has to be able to explain to the people what it stands for, what you're trying to achieve. And I think this has been part of the problem sometimes of the G20, not having that clear narrative how all these work streams are leading to something. So I think that focusing very much on growth, this resilience, has given it that focus, and I think that's important. There's also been a linking of the work streams, and I think the one where this is highlighted the most, I think, is looking at how developing countries' aspects on a particular items, how how it impacts on them. This, we've seen it very much on infrastructure, we've seen it on tax. There's been a lot of work of looking at, now how does this apply to developing countries? So I think this is another strength of trying to pull all the strands together, because one of the criticisms that's been made is that there's so many competing areas, how can you have a focus if you're looking at the whole range of things? The, we've heard a lot about the 2% the growth target, and I think one of the important things about that is that it has changed the conversation within the G20 on growth. Uh, and it needed to change because th the strategy wasn't working in many respects. And this was really, I think, changed the conversation. It's recognised that if you need extra growth, you need extra policies. It's as simple as that. It's not as business as usual. You do need to do more. You do need to take that step. You do need to have that extra policies. And I think that's been a very important. It has helped to link this theme of growth. Um, what we've seen in Cairns in terms of the policy proposals that countries have put on the table already, the assessment by the IMF and the OECD that if these policies are implemented by the countries, that would add 1.8 per cent to growth. That's quite a, an achievement. And it's a significant success over the preparation of previous action plans within the G20, and we've seen them at every summit. And in many respects, they have been a restatement of existing policies. And as I say, if you want to lift the game, if you want to lift the growth, you need to do more. And I think the fact that we've reached the stage that we have countries making commitments that the IMF and the OECD assess, if implemented, will actually lead to stronger growth. That is quite, a, quite an achievement. And again, this is, I think, the focus, the political focus that can come from the G20. This is one of the strengths. And the focus on infrastructure is very important. We've heard a lot of it. We've seen it this week here with the release of the WEO, the IMF's World Economic Outlook, the focus it's put on infrastructure. How can that be an important driving aspect of trying to improve the growth? And we are focusing, I think the other important thing is that we're focusing on the need to lift the growth potential of countries. As the IMF has said, we have seen the growth potential of countries 
been reduced as a consequence of the, of the crisis, as a consequence of significant unemployment, the de-skilling of people, the reduction in participation rates, and also the reduction in investment, the decline in the capital stock, and we know that that's an essential to try and drive productivity growth. So putting the focus on infrastructure, I think, is an important aspect. The one aspect I think is well, my own personal view where particular focus has to be put on in infrastructure is picking the right projects. That's not the projects which have the biggest political payoff for politicians, but it's the projects which those that are selected and prioritised through a fully transparent uh, cost-benefit analysis that looks at all the social economic costs involved, that's the most critical aspect, and that's one where all countries actually don't do very well project selection. So I think all of that is a great strength, but we have the problem of implementation. And at the Cairns G20 finance ministers meeting, the um, French finance minister spoke about the fog of contradiction. He said the fog of contradiction was, here we are at the G20 all talking about lifting growth, what we're going to do to increase growth, and at the same time, the international organisations are lowering their forecasts for growth. And we're seeing it this week highlighted. The fog is perhaps thicker in the sense of what we've seen now with the IMF three times this year, lowering its forecast for global growth, talking about the potential of a long period of mediocre growth at an inflection point. There is, for the public, it's very hard to reconcile these things. The talk about all the great work that G20 is going to do to lift growth and the IMF lowering their projections, their next five-year projections lowering them. Now, this comes back to the challenge, and that is the implementation. What we're seeing is what the G20 is talking about is what they're going to do, not what they're doing right now, what they're going to do in the future. And there, there has to be this focus on implementation. I think Ambassador Beasley said it this morning that the G20's credibility is on the line, and it is very hard. We're talking about difficult policies that countries have to go back and win their own domestic political battles just have to look at Europe in terms of the concern that Europe is facing now and the challenges of getting some of those reforms through Europe. But it's the same in every country. It's one thing to make the commitments of what you're going to do. The implementation is very difficult and we have to recognise that. But the G20, I think, needs to really, to build credibility, is put more and more emphasis on the monitoring of implementation and getting the international organisations to monitor what each country is doing, making the commitments very country specific and monitoring them and going forward. The real test, of course, will come when the international organisations, they believe the commitments that the G20 is saying and they increase their forecasts on the basis of what these commitments are seeing. And we're not at that point yet. Now that's the challenge there. The other challenge that the G20 is facing, but we're also seeing strengths, I think, is in terms of showing evidence of cooperation and dealing with international issues. And I call the international issues those where no one country can solve acting unilaterally. They're ones where you really do need to cooperate. They're ones on international trade, international tax, globally operating financial institutions, and of course this climate change is also one that requires international cooperation. But the strength we're seeing in the G20, I think we're seeing it on the work that's been done on strengthening financial regulation and the political drive that's come through the G20 to support the Financial Stability Board in advancing that. Of course, many of the reforms still have to be implemented. It's the challenge of implementation comes. We're seeing it uh, on tax, and I think the work on tax avoidance, tax evasion, it's critically important. This is one where you really do need cooperation between countries, but it's very, very tough. But we have seen great progress, and I think that's where we've seen the strength of the G20. The fact that we're at the point nearly of ending bank secrecy with the automatic exchange of tax information, that's quite a remarkable achievement, and I would hope from the Brisbane summit we would have at least all G20 men members committing to adopt the automatic exchange of tax information. That's quite an achievement. The work that's been done on the corporate tax evasion, tax avoidance through the base erosion and profit shifting, the work that the OECD has been doing. The G20 has put the political wind in the sails of the OECD. Uh, and that really, I think, highlights really the focusing of political um, momentum that can come through the G20. 
And the, it's a very ambitious work program the OECD has, and the fact that they've produced seven of their 15 reports over two years, that they deliver them in September, that's quite an achievement, and it does come with the real and demonstration of how you can get a political momentum driving an issue. But of course, it is work in progress. Many of the difficult issues are still in front. In terms of implementation, it's really you've got to wait till the whole package is done before things are going to be implemented. And of course, what's coming from the OECD is really soft law, just recommendations. Each country has to take them up and put them in their own national laws. But that's, that's the challenge, the implementation. One thing I would hope that may come from the Brisbane Summit is almost a down payment by G20 members in terms of the commitment to dealing with the concerns around base erosion profit shifting, and that would be that they would all agree to adopt the country by country reporting of transfer pricing. It's a very technical issue, but it's a very important one, and it really is that it's a, a point that the Australian Commission of Taxation has made, and that is that we have multinational operations that operate globally, that don't operate in one jurisdiction, tax administrators have to do the same. They have to operate globally, they have to have the information flows of what the multinational corporations are doing to be able to assess whether they've got excessively aggressive tax planning strategies. And that country by country reporting is something that I think can be done and really would be quite a significant step. But I also think that what the G20 has to do is recognise that we're seeing a, a transformation in the international forum that's dealing with tax, international tax issues, which is reflecting the changing nature of the global economy. And that is that it's no longer an OECD-centric exercise. It's now an OECD with the non-OECD, non-G20 OECD um, uh, members are part of that, but also the need to more formally bring in developing countries in dealing with this issue because it's of critical importance to them. The other aspect in terms of where international cooperation is vital at the moment is on international trade. The India's vetoing of the Bali, taking forward the Bali trade package that was agreed in December 2013, that has been a blow to the WTO and a blow to really the, the international trading system as such. And if the G20 truly is the, uh, a leader, the premier forum in terms of international cooperation, it needs to really put confidence back into the international trading system and confidence back into the WTO. It's not the forum for negotiating trade deals. It should be looking at the global system, but it can lead by example in terms of uh, really going forward with the recommendations the B20 have put out by really roll, taking each member, rolling back the protectionist measures, including non-tariff uh, barriers. Uh, each member implementing the trade facilitation uh, measures uh, without waiting for formal ratification through the WTO. But it also needs to put the strategic direction into the WTO and the global trading system. That should be based around global value chains. It should be looking beyond Doha, setting some strategic goals there. The other thing I just find, uh, finish, uh, other important point is the G20 has to, and I think this is in the Australian agenda and approach, it has to strengthen the international organisations because they say it's a political forum, it's not a doer. The doer is, in many respects are the international organisations. It has to strengthen the IMF, and it can be strengthening the IMF in terms of uh, the monitoring that the IMF does of each G20 member's commitment for the growth strategies. That's strengthening surveillance for the IMF. It has to strengthen the Financial Stability Board. It has to strengthen the WTO. It's hard to imagine a world if we didn't have the dispute resolution mechanisms of the WTO. It's quite vital. It has to advance the forum for dealing with international tax issues, which is moving beyond the OECD, but it really has to provide that because that is the doer. And there is a gap in the global governance structure on energy. We do need to have a, a new body that brings together both the consumers and the producers in the energy area. We don't have that now. These are things I think are really aspects that the G20 should be looking at because they really are the underlying plumbing of international governance in an integrated world. I'll stop there, man. Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Really uh, terrific um, introduction and, and the, um, 
the, the Australian framing of this, I, I really think, is, is helpful, this growth and resilience, sort of as you call it, political narrative, which, which helps to organize a lot of complicated issues, but you very nicely, I think, fit them into those, those different buckets um, and, uh, and highlighted uh, you know, some of the key issues and, of course, the word implementation we didn't miss. Uh, you said it a few times. It is a key issue to, to all of these issues, so appreciate your highlighting all of that. I'll move right on to Mark. Okay, thank you. So it's uh, great to be here today with some of my favorite and longtime colleagues. Uh, Mike and I worked together for years, Domenico known for years as well, and, and Matt, um, I remember Matt when he was the organizer of our treasury softball team and he, uh, he imposed green t-shirts with the word deadheads on it, which became the name of our team and we we had a distinguished uh, center fielder's shortstop. He played both positions, who's uh, testifying in New York today in a trial. Um, but anyway, let me outline today some of the uh, main areas of the G20 financial track agenda from the U.S. perspective. So let me start first with the global outlook. Uh, the U.S. economy continues to be a source of strength for the world. Um, the IMF marked up the U.S. forecast. Uh, real GDP rebounded in the second quarter. Uh, most forecasters are anticipating continued healthy growth in the U.S. Uh, through the end of this year and into 2015. The administration is projecting G real GDP growth of to average 3.3 percent for uh, the next two years. Labor market conditions have strengthened. The unemployment rate is a six-year low, and over the past 54 months, our private sector has created uh, 10 million new jobs. So uh, we see the solid underlying momentum of the U.S. economy uh, as due to the U.S. swift and comprehensive crisis response, including macroeconomic support, measures to restore the health of the financial sector, and structural reforms. In contrast, the global picture is far less bright. With few exceptions, growth has slowed over the course of the year, and deflation has become a key risk in some parts of the world. Global growth forecasts, as Mike notes, are being marked down, and risks are to the downside. In the euro area, the protracted recovery from the Great Recession has failed to gain solid and durable momentum, and inflation remains dramatically low. Inadequate support for aggregate demand in recent years particularly in large European surplus countries, has left domestic demand well below pre-crisis levels. Some recent steps towards a more accommodative pro-growth strategy are encouraging, but boosting domestic demand is key, and efforts to do so should be supported by decisive actions across the full range of economic policies. In Japan, demand and real wage growth continue to lag. This makes it even more important for Japan to step up structural reform efforts, the, criti the critical third arrow of Prime Minister Abe's program, to establish sustained economic growth. Growth in many emerging markets, including China, has downshifted. Some argue that accommodative monetary and fiscal policies will take away incentives for countries to pursue needed structural reforms. In fact, macroeconomic and structural policies work together and should go hand in hand. Stronger economic growth can also lead to more sustainable public finances. Debt sustainability is usually framed in terms of the debt to GDP ratio, and it is every bit as much about the denominator as the numerator. At the G20, the United States has been a strong proponent of focusing on growth and job creation, and this is at the top of the agenda. We strongly support Australia's effort to use its presidency to advance clear and ambitious growth strategies for G20 countries. And I agree with Mike Callahan's judgment that the growth strategies build uh, forcefully upon uh, the progress made last year in the G20 and in terms of shifting the debate um, away from fiscal consolidation towards growth, which is clearly where it absolutely needs to be. 
Substantial progress has already been made towards the G20's objective of boosting uh, collective output by more than 2 percent over the next five years. Mike referenced the uh, Cairns Summit uh, uh, statement that uh, the projections show a 1.8 percent increase. Specific commitments will be announced at the Brisbane Summit in November. Particularly where growth is the slowest, though, countries need to overcome the risk that protracted cyclical weakness pulls down potential growth. This problem of so-called hysteresis needs to be tackled forcefully now. It is imperative that policies be recalibrated to provide the same kind of comprehensive crisis response that the U.S. has pursued. The, if the growth strategy initiative is to be successful in boosting potential growth, the G20 must work together not only on medium-term structural reforms, but also on near-term macroeconomic policies that promote demand today. In the run-up to Brisbane, we will emphasize that all countries facing low inflation and high unemployment need to work more aggressively to eliminate a large and persistent demand gap, and that countries with large current account surpluses are in the strongest position to do more to boost domestic demand. Second. The United States supports a strong G20 focus on investment and infrastructure. We see investment, both public and private, as one key to boosting growth prospects. To help drive more public-private partnerships and increase private financing for infrastructure here in the United States, President Obama has established the Build America Investment Initiative. This government-wide undertaking will help encourage collaboration between private investors and state and local governments, expand the market for public-private partnerships, and put federal credit programs to greater and more effective use. All of these efforts stem from the recognition that upgrading our infrastructure is vital to propelling economic growth today and far into the future. We also expect the G20 to discuss opportunities to work together to close the global infrastructure deficit drawing on the tools provided by multilateral development banks and other sources of public and private financing. Third, the G20's effort to design a more stable and resilient global financial system has been a major success. An international financial regulatory reform and its implementation, to pick up on Mike's theme, remains a key priority for the United States on the road to Brisbane. The U.S. has led the effort to raise global standards and promote a safer, sounder financial system and a race to the top. Australia has a strong agenda focusing on robust implementation of financial reforms in four areas. So the first area is capital and liquidity. We continue to promote uh, in the U.S. the consistent implementation of Basel III capital and liquidity standards. These reforms have helped strengthen the U.S. banking system. Our 30 largest banks have raised more than $500 billion in capital since the crisis. Already this year, agreements have been reached on a common international leverage ratio and the liquidity coverage ratio. And important work is now underway to finalize the net stable funding ratio by Brisbane. Ongoing work on enhancing the consistency of risk weighting practices across jurisdictions remains critical. Second area, uh, financial sector area is resolution. The most <coughs> critical financial sector deliverable for Brisbane is a robust and credible proposal for total loss absorbing capacity to facilitate the orderly resolution of systemically important banks. During its recent plenary meeting in Cairns, the Financial Stability Board made considerable progress towards this goal and is now in a position to deliver a proposal by Brisbane so those of us that had the pleasure of going to Cairns, we got to go really far to nail down this proposal. Um, this is a major advance in our efforts to tackle too big to fail internationally and protect taxpayers from bearing the burden of any global bank's failure. Third area uh, financial sector front uh, this year is derivatives. The U.S. continues to lead the way in implementing the G20 Pittsburgh Summit commitments on clearing, trading, and reporting of derivatives. It is important for other G20 jurisdictions to swiftly implement derivatives reforms so we can better align reforms and avoid frank fragmentation. Uh, the fourth area, then, is shadow banking. Um, 
Here, the U.S. has implemented key reforms on money market funds, securitization activities, and the tri-party repo market. The G20 must remain vigilant to potential systemic risks that may emerge in this sector. I guess that there's one other point I wanted to make about shadow banking. I mean, many of us in the United States feel that uh, shadow banking is a bit of a misnomer, that really it's market-based finance or uh, indirect forms of finance. And, and it's an important issue because um, shadow banking has a bit of a pejorative connotation. But um, in fact, uh, many parts of the world, many countries need to develop uh, indirect uh, forms of uh, finance to uh, provide for greater uh, financial reform and liberalization. So it's, it's very important that uh, the systemic risk from shadow, shadow banking be uh, properly overseen and addressed. But it's important um, also to recognize the important role that market-based finance can play in helping uh, promote uh, financial sectors and, uh, and growth. Um, okay, so uh, fourth uh, main area uh, on the financial track this year um, is the international tax agenda, which Mike spoke extensively about. Uh, as Mike noted, uh, the G20 has taken up several initiatives that will help combat tax evasion and tax avoidance by multinational corporations and help level the playing field for U.S. workers and firms. Uh, one major initiative is the G20 OECD Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, or BEPS. This project aims to level the playing field and end mismatches that companies exploit to avoid paying taxes. While this project will not conclude until the end of uh, 2015, the United States is confident that BEPS will produce tangible results and make progress towards accomplishing its goals. I think there's important uh, overlaps between the BEPS agenda and uh, the debates we're seeing in the United States about uh, inversions. In the area of fighting illegal tax evasion, the G20 is continuing the work led by the United States on the automatic exchange of tax information with FATCA in 2010. The uh, common reporting standard, which is the standard for uh, addressing uh, automatic exchange of information, will accomplish the multilateralization of FATCA, or as we're now calling it in the United States, FATCA for all. Um, with the continued support of G20 member uh, nations, these initiatives will help level the playing field and promote a fair uh, tax system. Um, I'd like to say a brief word on sovereign debt restructuring, which is uh, becoming uh, a discussion point uh, lately. The G20 has focused on facilitating the market-based approach of strengthening contractual clauses in sovereign bonds. So a Treasury, a U.S. Treasury uh, convened working group um, recently paved the way for the London-based International Capital Markets Association to propose new clauses. Um, and since then, these are being adopted. Uh, the, there's new pari passu uh, clause language and a uh, provision for aggregating bonds uh, in a single vote, um, and, and you probably saw uh, this week that Kazakhstan has become the first issuer with both of these new clauses. Many other countries have issued with the pari passu clauses. Uh, we're hoping that uh, there will be more first movers and many more second movers. Now, while not a panacea, this enhancement of the market-based contractual uh, approach is a critical step forward in strengthening the sovereign debt restructuring process and the international monetary system. And one thing, one further thing to be clear upon is that neither the G20 nor the IMF has any plans to revive work on the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Finally, um, we will reiterate the administration's strong and ongoing commitment to passing IMF quota reform legislation as the world's first responder to financial crises and economic threats, the IMF promotes global growth and stability and protects our national security and the health of the U.S. economy. Passing uh, this legislation is clearly in the U.S. interests and the world's. 
we remain committed to moving forward with the modernization of the global financial architecture, which the United States has led since the creation of the IMF and the World Bank after World War II. Thank you. Th thanks, Mark. Really um, terrific. Um, a lot of um, important detail in there because uh, this is what the G20 has been working on from the from day one, and it's important to understand how these um, these critical issues of um, growth, uh, financial reform, and, and institutional reform have been at the core of the, the G20 ag agreement uh, process from the beginning and, and, and what the outlook is for, for moving the, that agenda forward. So thank you for that. Um, Domenico. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to, um, um, to this panel. You know, in two days, uh, I've been uh, at CSIS twice, which I think attests to the uh, increasing cooperation between our respective institutions. So I also have a disclaimer to make that uh, I don't know much about basketball, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I can talk uh, pretty much fluently about soccer if you wish. And then, uh, uh, you know, coming to uh, today's topic, uh, um, I think the fundamental point is really the premise of uh, our discussion is that, um, as the IMF has made clear, Mike has already recalled that, there is a fundamental tension between um, you know, the G20 that is talking about how to revive growth, growth prospects, and the Australian chair has made this a key priority of its own uh, presidency of the G20, and yet you know, the um, forecast that the IMF uh, has just released, the uh, increasing downside risks, and the unevenness of uh, growth patterns across different regions uh, of the world. In particular, you know, the, as uh, um, Mark has recalled, uh, the Eurozone continues to act as a drag to uh, global economic growth. Uh, so clearly there is unevenness, and uh, there is unevenness in growth patterns, but there is also unevenness, I would say, in how uh, various G20 members look at um, uh, receipts economic policies that are needed, that are required uh, to uh, uh, spur growth. And I think the IMF uh, has uh, uh, provided in these days a very powerful uh, conceptual framework uh, to sort of summarize uh, uh, both the uh, G20 finance, uh, finance minister's meeting in Cairns uh, a few days ago, as well as the discussion that uh, is going to take place in Brisbane in the coming weeks. And this scheme that was uh, uh, presented by the managing director um, of the IMF a few days ago is a scheme that essentially consists of three arrows. It's always three. Um, and then, so on the one hand, you have uh, uh, demand support, uh, the need for demand management policies. And in fact, if you read the uh, latest uh, uh, final G20 finance ministers communique uh, in Cairns, you do see uh, you know, statements like uh, persistent weakness in demand, uh, we will continue to implement our fiscal strategies uh, flexibly to take into account near-term economic conditions. And uh, clearly you can have also an idea who uh, might have uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, encouraged uh, this, uh, uh, this wording. Um, on the other hand, um, you also have, uh, uh, you know, those countries who believe that uh, uh, supply-side reforms are key. And this is really the way to uh, revive growth. And clearly, some of these countries are leading economies uh, from the Eurozone. And, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you, again, you do see some language uh, to that effect. Supply side constraints hamper growth. Um, we agree to consider changes in the composition and quality of government expenditures and tax to enhance the contribution of our fiscal strategies to growth. So uh, these are different views, and uh, I have to say that um, Australian presidency um, has done a very, a very good work in terms of uh, putting them into a sort of consistent uh, framework. So uh, demand support on the one hand, uh, mainly focusing on the short term, and uh, um, on the other hand, you know, the need for supply uh, side reforms. And then there is uh, the third arrow, uh, that is uh, um, investment. And uh, um, this is clearly, a, I would say, really a, a key component of the um, uh, narrative of the Australian presidency of the G20. Uh, here I detect uh, some slight nuances between what you uh, read in, the, uh, in this week's WIO of the IMF, 
and the narrative that has been put forward by the Australian presidency of the G20, the uh, Australians seem to be focusing more on uh, investment from the private sector, uh, private-public partnerships, while uh, in contrast, the IMF um, uh, clearly has a more uh, nuanced view, uh, and it also focuses a lot on, on public, uh, on the need for public investment in infrastructures. And of course, uh, you know, this third arrow is uh, functional to the first as well as to the second arrow. In uh, countries where there is lacking demand, uh, countries where you know, there is a deficit uh, in, the, in uh, domestic demand, clearly investment, more investment can help to um, uh, reinvigorate uh, uh, demand. In other countries that are running at full capacity, uh, Germany, to make one, uh, one example, um, clearly, investments uh, would be instrumental to, um, uh, you know, increase uh, supply, to increase productivity. So, would act more, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, structural reforms to the uh, to the economy. Um, so, as you can see, this these frameworks uh, this framework squares the potential dichotomy dichotomy between short term and longer term priorities. Uh, but it also provides an encompassing uh, uh, framework where you can square you know, slightly different views between, for instance, the US um, as well as uh, Germany and, uh, and other countries. Um, uh, if we look at, again, if we look at um, um, uh, the recent uh, topics that the G20 has, has taken up, uh, one, uh, I think one fundamental uh, um, topic uh, that I would like to stress, and Mark has actually already done that, is that the G20 um, finance ministers uh, meeting in Cairns, uh, for the first time to my knowledge, uh, referred to sovereign debt uh, uh, restructuring. And uh, it did so by essentially endorsing a market-based approach uh, this is the way I'm reading the communique, but uh, uh, Mark, uh, who contributed to writing the communique, might have uh, maybe a uh, uh, slightly different view. And I think the timing is also interesting, because a few days before uh, this finance minister's meeting in Cairns, the UN in New York uh, was for the first time voting a resolution uh, for um, uh, initiating work towards a, a convention a, that is a statutory approach uh, to sovereign debt restructuring. And as you know, uh, this is the first time that you had a very high number of countries voting for their resolution, uh, about 130, mainly um, emerging and developing countries. 11 countries voted against that resolution, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, so clearly the biggest, the countries that have the biggest financial centers uh, voted against the resolution, and clearly this casts doubts, you know, uh, in terms, even if this uh, convention uh, is ever going to be, uh, is, is ever going to see the light of the day, uh, clearly not having the main financial centers as part of these efforts would cast, uh, uh, you know, some uh, doubt on the uh, ultimate effective effectiveness of this convention, assuming that it does move forward, which is which should not be taken for granted. Um, so, you know, in this debate, uh, I see the G20 as clearly taking a position, uh, you know, supporting uh, um, voluntary market uh, market based approach. It's also interesting that while the G20 finance ministers <coughs> were discussing this issue a country, uh, Kazakhstan, was also issuing uh, uh, bonds, uh, essentially uh, incorporating the uh, new standards, the provisions uh, uh, that Mark was referring to and that uh, had been issued by the International Capital Markets uh, Association. Uh, so I think, you know, if anything, we're going to see more developments on sovereign debt restructuring, but more, of course, on the market-based approach than, uh, than anything else. In any case, this, this still remains an open, a slightly open issue. Um, finally, um, what I also want to, uh, if I have uh, just a few more seconds, Mark, what I also want to uh, share with you uh, is a sort of a <clears throat> very preliminary uh, results of uh, a survey that uh, we do among CG experts ahead of any G20 summit. And, and this year, like uh, last year, we um, asked our about 20, 21 CG scholars uh, 
how would you rate progress in a global economic governance over the latest uh, 12 months? And uh, essentially, the results of this uh, survey, which uh, is going to be posted online um, in the next couple of weeks, um, they unequivocally point to um, very minimal progress on average across the various areas that the survey um, uh, looks at, that is um, macroeconomic policy cooperation, uh, financial regulation, trade and climate change. Uh, climate change is the worst, where we actually see some regress rather than progress. But financial regulation is actually the area where CG scholars have seen more progress. Um, and uh, and, and uh, in a way, this matches what Mark was saying, and of course also what uh, uh, you know, the finance ministers uh, said in the communique. So again, at, in Brisbane, uh, we're going to see um, more progress on this, uh, <coughs> uh, in this area. And right now, this really is, uh, you know, the, um, the area where um, more international cooperation is, is taking place. Uh, but I would say, on the whole, um, you know, this survey points to uh, a number of setbacks. Uh, clearly, lack of uh, uh, ratification of IMF reform is an issue, not just for itself, not just because so far the uh, U.S. Congress has not ratified the Seoul package, but because by doing so, Essentially, the trajectory that had been envisaged in the G20 process has been jeopardized, compromised. The idea was not just to pass this uh, Seoul package, uh, but of course, uh, you know, other um, um, uh, reform package would come along the way. Now, all this is at a standstill, and of course, this has uh, compromised the, um, uh, to, to some extent, uh, the willingness, the commitment of emerging economies to rely on the G20 as a premier forum for international economic cooperation. So thank you very much, Matt, and I'll stop here. Thank you, Domenico, and um, uh, particularly your last point about the, the sort of direction of international governance I, I want to pursue because I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and, uh, but let me, um, let me first um, follow up on one other thing which Mike said, and then I'm going to open it up to questions here after one and a half questions, um, maybe two and a half. Um, Mike, uh, you talked about implementation and how important that is and totally agree. Um, an important part of the implementation mechanisms that the G20 created early on was the so-called MAP or mutual assessment process. I don't hear that term written or said very much anymore. What happened to the mutual assessment pro pro um, process and, and is that, uh, or has that just been transmogrified into a new form uh, and not called that anymore? It's still there. I think if you have a look at what was in the communique from Cairns, uh, you have countries saying that we will be focusing on the implementation, monitoring amongst ourselves, the same, the mutual um, monitoring of it. Uh, but I do think that there's a, always a limit to how much that can be done. The great strength of that was saying this was the reforms were led by G20 members, not imposed by international organisations. This was one of the distinguishing elements as opposed to just doing what um, the IMF was saying in terms of surveillance, etc. This was a, a member-led driven, this was meant to be very strong. I think it has evolved to the point now where we do have countries coming forward presenting their plans, their growth strategies that they're going to, as Mark said, we're going to see the detail will be revealed in Brisbane. There should be part of the mutual assessment process of looking at how those are being implemented. But I do think that the great strength that's going to come from that is calling on the international organisations, be it through the, what we're seeing now with the IMF and the OECD providing their almost independent assessment of how is it going, I think that's combining the two together. It can be the forum, the G20 provides the forum where you, at the political level where you're saying, well, how are we going? We're holding ourselves accountable. As the ambassador said, we've drawn the line in the sand. We have to deliver. And you do want to strengthen the, the international organisations in their role in providing the oversight and the monitoring. And that's what I think one of the um, combined aspects you can be 
in focusing on the implementation, G20 members holding themselves more accountable for what they're doing, but at the same time strengthening the IMF in its role and the OECD in its role of providing surveillance, providing oversight of how countries are going, and that's one of their roles, and I do think that we're seeing that evolution take place. So I, d I don't think it's to say that the whole concept of mutual assessments dropped out. It's evolving and I think hopefully strengthening. Um, the other thing that you don't hear as much about, it's still in there, but the Pittsburgh uh, framework was uh, called for strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. And that last adjective, balanced, you still you know, see references to, but, but it doesn't seem to have as, carry as much emphasis. Is that simply because, Mark, the current account imbalances have, uh, at least in a cyclical sense um, adjusted and, and so there isn't so much of an immediate concern about balances. How much, of, how much is rebalancing still part of the G20 agenda? Thanks. Can I just say 30 seconds on your first question to Mike? So there's something called the Framework Working Group uh, which has uh, consistently met throughout. Um, and, uh, you know, I think whether we say map or not, I mean, the map was associated very heavily a few years ago with kind of an indicator-based process to uh, look at some of the key countries that uh, were uh, seen as um, having imbalances and how to address them. Uh, that process, uh, I think, is on a two-year cycle. But more generally, the Framework Working Group continues to meet. Um, this year, a heavy emphasis besides the macro situation has been this uh, the question of the growth strategies, um, and the growth strategies have been peer-reviewed twice, um, and more work is going on. Uh, there's also work on kind of an accountability assessment. So, um, so I would say it continues, but in a bit of a different uh, form with a different focus, but that reflects the evolution of the uh, discussion and focus of the G20. Um, so I, I welcome your question about strong, sustainable, and balanced uh, growth um, and global rebalancing. Um, so I, for the United States, global rebalancing, global imbalances remains a uh, major focal point. To go back to Pittsburgh uh, for, you know, the audience, um, the the central thought uh, underlying the strong, sustainable, and balanced uh, growth framework, um, which Mike was part of as well at the time, was that as the global economy um, uh, recovered uh, from the crisis, we wanted a more sustainable, well, we wanted a, a pattern of growth in which there was greater adjustment between, by surplus and deficit countries. So uh, surplus countries would take steps to boost domestic demand um, and reduce their current account surpluses as a result, and uh, deficit countries um, would increase national saving. And we thought this would provide a more sound foundation for uh, global growth. Now, um, it is true, as Matthew suggested, that current account imbalances uh, have been reduced, uh, notably in China and the United States. Um, if you look at the global level, uh, though, um, our feeling is that much of the adjustment um, in uh, global imbalances um, is associated uh, considerably with demand compression. Um, and so there, there are active debates. So when we talk about what is the macro agenda and how do we get growth, I think it relates to uh, the strong, sustainable, and a balanced uh, agenda. But clearly, uh, it is important. We continue to emphasize the role of uh, surplus countries um, in boosting domestic demand. You heard that in my remarks. Um, I didn't talk about uh, exchange rate issues, but uh, there are important um, set of G20 exchange rate uh, commitments that you will see basically 
to uh, promote market-based uh, or market-determined exchange rates, to refrain competitive devaluations, to not target exchange rates um, for competitive purposes, et cetera. Those are very important, and those are things that uh, we continue to push. So, um, you know, we're five years past Pittsburgh. Perhaps we say the words strong, sustainable, and balanced growth uh, less. Let's be honest, there are different views around the G20 uh, on the issue, um, but this is something that remains pretty fundamental to the United States and uh, that we push. Um, yes, um, so on the map, uh, what I would say is that, uh, you know, the idea came about in the context of the G20 process, the G20 framework, which essentially envisages a sort of contract, uh, if I may use this term, between uh, emerging economies and, on the one hand and advanced economies on the other. So emerging economies, namely China, would uh, act uh, uh, in a direction to um, uh, rebalance their own economies. Uh, and then, and then uh, um, uh, advanced economies would work towards uh, uh, giving ad uh, emerging economies a stronger voice in, uh, global, in global governance fora. As I mentioned uh, in my uh, previous remarks, uh, this has not been quite the case. And therefore, um, I think that the um, ability of the map to deliver um, real results uh, as a result has been compromised. Um, I think when, uh, you know, when the map was introduced, China was uh, clearly the country uh, to go to with the, uh, you know, the largest current account surplus. I think both in absolute magnitude as well as uh, a percentage of GDP. I think what is interesting now is that uh, we have one region in the world where demand is extremely weak. Um, you know, there is uh, deflation um, in a substantial number of economies of this region, and yet the current account surplus is increasing. So I really think that Europe should be doing more to be a responsible partner of the G20. Um, again, on the issue of rebalancing, uh, in a way, um, and I think this is really interesting the way, you know, the Australian presidency has cast this issue that is politically charged, it has cast this issue in a, a, a micro-founded way, uh, in, in, in a way that is uh, um, sort of less contentious. But at the end of the day, if you buy in this uh, need for more investments, what you are doing on the micro side is, yes, more investment, but the macroeconomic implication is actually, uh, you know, um, um, a, a rebalancing. And therefore, uh, you know, the rebalancing is still on the agenda. However, it has lost the politically charged um, sort of uh, um, feature, and it has, been, uh, um, it has been cast in a kind of more micro-founded, uh, less uh, politically uh, charged way. Thank you. Whoops. Thank you. Um, thanks, all of you. Um, I have another question, but I'm going to withhold that until the end if we have time, because I know there are probably questions from the floor. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and please do ask a question of the panel. Yes, ma'am. There's a woman sitting there. Daniel, thanks. Hi, I'm Nancy Alexander with the Heinrich Gold Foundation. Thanks for the great presentations. Um, Mike, I'd like to drill in on a one thing you said, and that was about the infrastructure agenda and the importance of choosing the right projects. You know, you've really been a leader in um, that making that message, that important message. And it would be great to hear how you see that happening, particularly given uh, what we see as, as three evolving realities. One, we have nothing against mega projects and transformational projects, but you know, in fields like energy, they don't have a good record of getting like electricity to the poor, meeting some of the goals that we'd like to see. Secondly, the groups that we work in, with in numerous countries can't get any information at all out of regional uh, pipelines and project preparation facilities, just none. In fact, they've been threatened when they've asked in some countries. And lastly, the World Bank's uh, independent evaluation group came out with some pretty sobering results on public-private partnerships, for instance, that given the uh, uncertain data on efficiency, uh, that 
PPPs may not provide any additionality. And secondly, what I found as a really shocking outcome of the evaluation, namely the lack of any quantification of contingent liabilities on a project level, that's really a recipe when you're talking about mega projects for a debt disaster if you're not quantifying the contingent liabilities. But um, your perspective on choosing the right projects. Yes. Um I think that, like many of these things, it's going to depend on country circumstances always. And I think it's one of the things is wrong to have a sort of a one-size-fits-all for a solution to everyone's problems. We do know that the private sector tapping this liquidity can be such an important source for financing infrastructure. Uh, the public-private partnerships are complex. Uh, approach to doing it. Uh, a lot of capacity building is required. Uh, in many respects, though, that's the financing angle, and a lot of the focus has been on the financing. But before we get to the financing, no matter how you're going to finance it, the economic value of the project, the social, whether it passes the net social benefit test, has nothing to do with the financing. I think this has come out on all the work of the international organisations we're seeing. And that's why I think we're seeing it, the, if the references are there or the focus on infrastructure. It's within the work of the B20. They say we need to have this pipeline of bankable quality uh, projects that have been uh, rigorously cost tested. It's there. The point I'd make is that doing it is a very hard task and making sure you do it where you take into account the full consequences of the um, it's the economic, the environmental, the social, and also the long term. It's a, a very different approach you're looking at it than just looking at the financial viability of it. You have to look at the long term consequences of how it fits into the, the network. We know that that's a challenge, and we're seeing that in terms of the, uh, certainly through the multilateral development banks. That's why I think that one of the strengths of the G20 can do is sort of reinforcing good policy. And what I would like to see would be a lot more focus on one of the most important things, as you picked up, Nancy, I think, is transparency is such an important aspect of this. Uh, I know that the, the B20 recommends that to try and remove the political influence, and we do know that political influence can result in a lot of white elephant infrastructure projects as opposed to the more efficient use of the resources to provide the uh, improving the long-term productive capacity of the country. One of the ways of doing this, they've suggested that there'd be more project selection done through independent bodies. Now, I think that independence is a variable concept in terms of what in the, what some countries may say is an independent in terms of going through both the project selection and at the operational stage and the procurement stage, etc. The one thing that's so important in this and going to be reinforced is transparency because if you have very full transparency of all the factors that have gone into consideration, it doesn't matter who's doing the assessment, it's there for public scrutiny. And I think that that's, it's there in the work that have been recommendations from the B20, it's there and we're seeing it from the international organisations. In the work that the IMF has done in the chapter in the WIO, they make it very important that it is the getting the quality infrastructure projects is where you get this benefit. If you don't have the quality infrastructure projects, well, you're not going to get the benefit for growth and it's not going to get the, the added the fiscal multiplier that they, the significant positive fiscal multiplier they're talking about. Um, and the best way of doing that, I think, is this transparency. And that's why I think it would be good what I've been, sort of, I've been advocating is that this is, in terms of trying to reinforce good policy in all countries, is putting the emphasis on transparency of all the factors that go into the selection of, and also the operation of the infrastructure project. It can be a great anecdote to, uh, to ensuring that you, you do get the, the quality investments. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, John Keogh here from the Australian Financial Review. A uh, question for Mark. Uh, you were talking about the differences between the surplus and deficit countries there in the context of some of the G20 discussions. We've seen a big appreciation in the US dollar over the last month or so. Um, how, 
Well, does the US believe that that's largely down to economic fundamentals or do you see that that might be due to some intervention that might need to be discussed this week uh, at the G20 and IMF meetings? And secondly, on the BEPS project, I understand the US Treasury is largely supportive of it, although wants to look at the details of it to make sure it mix, uh, mixes well with America's tax system. Um, but I understand some Republicans in Congress who hold fairly senior positions on finance committees are not supportive of BEPS. Do you need the support of Congress to legislate this and how are you going to achieve that? Okay, Mark. So, um It'll come as no surprise to the audience. Uh, on the first question, there's a long-standing um, policy in the United States that only the Secretary of the Treasury can comment on exchange rates, and I'm not the Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> um, you know, on, on BEPS, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. There's 15 areas. There's, uh, there's working on, I forget if it's seven or eight this year, uh, seven, seven this year, eight next year. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we're committed to it. We're working hard on, um, you know, the various measures. We'll see what we can do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you're, you know, you're raising a broader point about legislation and, and tax reform in the United States. There's an active debate going on. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, widespread belief that there um, is a need for tax reform. Um, but that this is going to require uh, looking at the legislative agenda. And uh, so, you know, we will, this is a debate the Secretary uh, is, uh, you know, eager to engage in and will be uh, looking at uh, to work uh, on uh, in, the, in the future. Um, okay, I know you laugh at Mark's answer on the exchange rates, but if you had also been taken into that dark room your first week at Treasury and um, and put had a bright light shine and shone in your eyes as Mark and I and anybody else at the U.S. Treasury had, don't talk about exchange rates, um, you would understand uh, the position. Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Krista Hughes from Reuters. We heard earlier about the massive infrastructure gap that's expected. How much is, would it be appropriate and realistic for G20 countries to commit this year in funding to start to fill that gap? I think that's impossible to put a quantifier to quantify exactly the amount. It's going to be on country specific. Uh, it's each country, some countries will not have the same priority for infrastructure as others. Uh, China, I'd say, is an example where it's not really in terms of what China has to do is move away from investment law to construction. A lot of it is improving the investment climate. I think that's in, it's been made clear, I think, in the Cairns communique that uh, for each country, and I hope that this will be in the growth strategies, what measures they're doing to improve their climate for investment. That's been a lot of recommendations from the international organisations there. Uh, we also know that it takes from the planning stage to introduce uh, infrastructure is quite long. Uh, from the early, you know, it is uh, to have you, you want to have the pipeline there, but to actually get it going is taking long. So I don't think it's one that you can put a specific target in a year of how much you want to do. Uh, what you want to do, I think what the world wants to see is that there's clear progress in going forward in doing these, in identifying them, in progressing. Uh, the, the, the range of issues that have been outlined in terms of uh, trying to facilitate the whole operation through this information hub, getting better, uh, uh, um, ex, you know, sharing experiences of how to solve these issues. All of that's going to take time. So I, I think putting a 12-month number around it would be rather meaningless. While others are thinking, let me ask the question I was going to ask before, which is a two-part question about the, the agenda, the breadth and the depth of the agenda. So on the breadth of the agenda for the G20, um, I mean, it started really with those three kind of core areas of growth, um, financial system reform and international financial architecture uh, reform. And it's spread now to a number of other areas, well, it's spread within those areas and to another, a number of other areas from energy to anti-corruption to development to a number of other things. 
And so I'm wondering what people think, the panelists think about uh, the trade-off between, you know, getting more important and pressing issues onto the agenda and and being able to remain focused on on the key things that really one can one should prioritize and can realistically get done in any particular time frame. So that's the sort of breadth question. And the depth question is, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but my brain hurts trying to remember all of the details of these different um, uh, GSIFIs and IFIs and um, OECDs and BEPs and everything. And some of this is very technical, um, important stuff. Uh, and the detail matters. The devil in the detail really matters. And yet, this is a political body, as Mike said, and it's a meeting of politicians and uh, leaders who uh, can't be expected to remember or even learn all of those acronyms. Uh, and so I wonder how do, you, how do you bridge that gap up and down between the kind of the hard, detailed work that needs to be done in this group and the, and the sort of political guidance that's needed to, to keep the agenda moving forward. Uh, you can comment on either or both of those, any, any of you. Maybe we can round up by doing that, maybe starting with Domenico and working down. Sure. Well, I think on that, uh, the uh, Australian presidency uh, struck the right balance because clearly the, the G20 doesn't have any more a political momentum in the way it, it had, uh, uh, you know, at the apex of the crisis for a number of reasons that have nothing to do with the Australian presidency itself, of course. So what, what they did, uh, I think, was to essentially leverage on um, domestic policy initiatives by the G20 member countries. However, at the same time, they did try to provide, uh, you know, a framework uh, to push a little bit the G20 membership. And I think the outcome of that is this, uh, um, uh, you know, number of initiatives that uh, the IMF and UACD have estimated will add 1.8 percentage point growth in a few years uh, from now. Um, and then what, uh, uh, you know, we're also seeing is uh, uh, more emphasis on uh, financial regulation, as I said. Uh, again, in the area of the reform of the international financial architecture, that's the only area where you can see, um, um, you know, something happening because clearly the aspect of uh, reforming international financial institutions uh, is something that is uh, clearly um, off the table uh, now for the reasons that we have just discussed. Um, I think one, uh, one aspect on which, uh, you know, per personally I'm a little bit unclear on what uh, the um, summit uh, or the Australian presidency um, has been delivering is, is trade. Because it's true that, uh, you know, on the one hand, we see the emergence of these mega deals um, that, uh, uh, you know, are not multilateral, are, are not global in scopes, uh, typically are between a large economy or region and other economies. Uh, but it is also true that these mega deals are essentially negotiated by, you know, different mega deals negotiated by a lot of G20 countries. And, uh, and clearly here, you know, I, I would see uh, much more scope for, you know, the Australian uh, presidency uh, to provide additional impetus, additional momentum on these trade deals that, again, are functional uh, to a growth agenda, are, uh, you know, not short term. Uh, you know, the G20 to ensure legitimacy and survival cannot focus on your short term issues if uh, these are not really compelling. So uh, right now the, uh, the, the issue is really making sure that growth prospects become more even across the membership, uh, they solidify, and I think this is where we are right now. So we need more focus on growth, and trade should be an, a much more important component than I actually have seen uh, you know, in the uh, Australian presidency. Thank you. So um, on the breath issue, um, so like you, uh, and you know, we discussed this when you were in the government working on these issues, uh, you know, my, that I'm in the keep it simple camp. Um, now, uh, I work on the finance track uh, this afternoon. Uh, Ms. Carolyn Atkinson, our Sherpa, will be here, which covers the full breadth of issues, finance and, and other issues. 
these issues, energy development, anti-corruption, trade, are usually handled out of the Sherpa track. I'd say in the finance track, uh, the agenda still is macro growth, FinReg, uh, IFE architecture. We've added tax. Um, so I think in FinReg, we are keeping it simple. Now, when we came out of the crisis, uh, you know, we were responding uh, on the macro policy front very clearly. Uh, Domenico and Mike have uh, underscored that um, there's a structural dimension to growth. And so I think if you look at, uh, for example, the Australian agenda uh, on growth, um, it very much emphasizes uh, uh, a range of other uh, things, you know, trade, competition, uh, employment, um, and they see those as very pro-growth, medium-term um, measures to uh, boost capacity. Infrastructure investment, of course, falls in that category as well. Um, so maybe I would, you know, I would think part of the answer to you is also that what is seen as the um, foundations for growth um, is a bit different now than when we were working together and just worried about, you know, how do we get out of this uh, deep hole? Um, and that makes me just say one thing in response to Dominica's earlier presentation, which is that um, I think there's a clear agreement in the G20 that uh, we need to look at aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Now, turning to the depth issue, um, so I think you're right uh, about the techie, uh, techiness. I mean, you see it in FinReg uh, in particular, uh, tax, um, something also I find fairly technical. I mean, what is the, do the G20 leaders or finance ministers have to know all the technical details? Um, I would say that a main function is to provide, uh, the British always used to like, like to use the word steer, and it's to provide a political steer, uh, guidance, direction, where we're headed, um, and to provide cover. And I think FinReg is actually uh, a fascinating case study of this. Um, so, you know, before the crisis, you know, you know, we have very independent regulators in the United States, and uh, and before the crisis, I would say, you know, of course, our, our regulators are st still very independent. Um, before the crisis, highly independent. I would say now, what's been transformed is that. Um, G20 leaders communiques, G20 finance ministers communiques, kind of set out some broad parameters for the direction of the financial regulatory agenda. And then the FSB um, kind of loose, and I, I want to underscore the word loosely, loosely coordinates. So the, the FSB is not, uh, you know, a standard setting in the banking realm, the Basel Committee is. But the leaders give, the leaders and finance ministers give direction. The, uh, the FSB kind of oversees that uh, the various directions are being carried out uh, by, be it the Basel Committee, be it IOSCO, the uh, International Association for Insurance Supervisors. Um, and so I think there's a little bit of a more coherence and, and organization um, to the governance structure in financial regulatory reform. Um, but again, I think it is the existence of the G20 um, leaders and finance processes that have allowed this kind of new, uh, I wouldn't, it's, it's not like a black line, very clear, but it, it has allowed this new kind of governance structure to evolve. And as I said in my statement, we've made huge progress. You see it in uh, Basel III, the leverage ratio, the liquidity ratios. You see it in the resolution work. Um, you see it in the OTC derivatives front, uh, even if that's coming along more slowly than uh, we anticipated. Shadow banking as well. So, so I think it's, I think we have to look at the leaders' 
and the finance ministers as giving us direction in which uh, and providing kind of this cover for a lot of the technical work to uh, take place. Okay, thanks. It is a very broad agenda. Uh, it covers working groups across so many things. I think I counted 69 different preparatory meetings right across a whole range of issues. And a lot of good work has been done. I wouldn't deny it. And I think, as you've said at the beginning, there's a lot of just the build-up of between countries that don't have this habit of cooperating. There's a lot of valuable work. But when you come to a leaders' meeting, when you come to a summit, as I say, this is a political issue. It has to have some headline outcomes. You can't come to a summit and say, well, we've made all this incremental progress across all these bits of aspects on the development committee and, and this aspect on financial regulation and some aspects this and that. You've got to be able to sell the story. It's got to be able to communicate. And leaders have to lead. And you have to be using what leaders can do. The great strength of the G20 is that leaders can come together. And what leaders can do is they can push the political envelope if you structure it that way. It's, it, they can take it beyond what officials can do. There's a limit to what officials can do in terms of pushing things across the frontier. That's what leaders can do. That's when the big great strength in the G20 when leaders do that. So they have to focus on some outcomes. There has to be headline outcomes. And it's not to diminish all the other good work that's being done across the whole range of issues. But when leaders come out of a summit, the great test would be, do they all say these were the same three key or four things that were achieved at this summit? Part of the problem of summits we've seen now, when leaders come out, when they talk to their press, they, they have different emphasis of what was there and immediately they're on to domestic issues and there's not sort of the same narrative coming out of what's being achieved. So I would hope that looking towards the way the lead up that's been taking place now, what would be some of the headline outcomes that would come from the Brisbane summit, is very much this one of growth. And the focus on growth, I think, as Marcus said, has many dimensions there. It picks up what's happening on labour market issues, it picks up on infrastructure, it picks up on competition, it picks up on trade aspects. But you've got a very clear change of conversation. We're pushing growth at structural reforms, we're pushing the growth envelope out there, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to it. The other one I would put an emphasis on is tax. This is a key issue now, particularly of civil society, the great concerns and inequality. This is the red light up there of this is, they want to see progress, international progress on tax, and as I say, the G20 has to have some down payment. There's a good work there, but to maintain that political momentum, they have to actually focus on some issues. The one I would say that they could focus on now is saying adopting this country by country reporting. They can do that now without waiting to the full completion of the 2015 package. But tax has to be up there and be seen to be achieving something. And the other one that Dominica has said, I think it has to be trade. They, in, there is a real problem now in terms of where the international trading system is. The G20 has to worry about all those other countries out there who are not in the G20. They're not in these preferential agreements. As uh, Mark Wallenberg said this morning um, about it is so important, the international trading system, the global trading system, reducing protections, there's rising protectionist pressures. The G20 has to lead on that. So there has to be a clear statement, a clear focus, pushing an envelope on trade. That's not to diminish all these other things, but these are the, what I would put out there as these headline outcomes, and that would make a successful summit. Excellent. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their great contributions.